morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief update on our upcoming programs, both in person and live stream. If you're not yet a member of the Council Town Hall, please be, uh, consider becoming a member or renewing your membership. It's a great way to support the organization so that we can continue to bring you this quality programming. For those of you who would like to ask Dan questions, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion, which will start in about 30 minutes. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our Professor Dan Schnur and his weekly program, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. Hey, Dan. Hey, Kim, how are you? Well, we're trying to stay cool like everybody else. How are you doing? Not too bad. Um, just remember, though, that we have viewers not just in sun and heat baked Los Angeles, but in, in other places too. So, for those of you in the upper Midwest or in Alaska or Canada, we're very jealous of you this week. We are. <laughs> Dan, you've got three fabulous topics, and I know we've been. Uh, talking about how you're going to manage time so we can get to all three. So let me um, list those off quickly and turn this over to you. Topic number one, the next COVID challenge, battle over vaccine mandates. Number two, is the economy in recovery or recession? And third, what we'll learn from the January 6th investigation. So take it away, Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. Uh, no shortage of topics as always, but these are the three on which we decided to focus. And as is always the case, you'll be getting a survey after the webinar today. And Jessica and Claire and I will be going through your responses. So if there are topics that you want to see us cover that we haven't before, just let us know and we'll do our best to get to them. But for right now, at least, we're going to start not surprisingly uh, with the reemergence of COVID. Uh, which is re-emerging with a vengeance, but in particular, I wanted to talk about the brewing war over vaccines and what that means, not just politically and economically, but socially and culturally as well. So not to put too fine a point on it, um, but COVID's going to be around for a while. As I mentioned last week, we sort of half-joked uh, a month or so ago, Kim and I did, about whether we might need to rename uh, this program, uh, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. And let's agree that for better or worse, that's not gonna be necessary anytime soon. In other words, we might be ready to be done with COVID, but COVID is certainly not ready to be done with us. The Center for Disease Control seems to be issuing new guidance almost daily but the bottom line seems to be that we don't know nearly as much about the coronavirus as we thought we did. And the fact that our vaccines don't make us as invulnerable as we once believed, combined with the very slow pace of our fellow Americans uh, getting vaccinated, has put the nation back on edge. We've learned now, uh, we've learned now that vaccines greatly, dramatically reduce the risk of COVID infection, but doesn't offer the absolute or the near absolute protection that many of us had assumed. And we're, therefore, we're seeing similar resurgences around the world. And the new conventional wisdom is that we may be dealing with this variant and its successors for a very long time. Just yesterday, Francis Collins, the director of the National Institute of Health said this, quote, most of the projections say we're in for a really tough August, September, and October, unquote. And Collins went on to talk about indoor mask mandates, which are now covering more than half of the state of California. I saw New York City made a similar announcement today. The state of Louisiana, which had been one of the strongest holdouts of from vaccinations and masking and social distancing requirements has now ordered a statewide uh, masking mandate uh, for, uh, for indoor activity. So that's gonna continue to spread. 
And I've read that President Biden may address the nation again later this week, which in my mind would be a good idea, given how rapidly changing these circumstances are. Now, COVID's comeback may lead to serious economic repercussions, and we'll talk about that later in today's program. And there's, of course, going to be a very sizable political impact, too, which I imagine we'll be talking about for weeks, if not months going forward. But today, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to talk, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to talk about the societal impact. Because I'll admit that the way those of us who have been vaccinated, those of us who've been vaccinated, and the way those uh, and those of us who have not, the way we're feeling about each other right now <laughs> has the potential for causing real problems going forward. And so I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But before we go any further, Claire, can you put up the first question for us? Because these tensions are growing between the, those who are vaccinated and those who are not. And so my question to all of you is how should society deal with those who have not yet been vaccinated? Should we continue to encourage vaccinations and hope the numbers increase? Option two, should there be mandates? Should employers in public spaces like restaurants now require vaccinations to enter? Even further, should vaccines be mandated for everyone in the country? Or fourth and finally, should we just let people make up their own minds? And Claire, let's see those answers once we have them ready. Very interesting. Wow. 64%, almost two thirds of you, believe that employers and public spaces like restaurants and presumably theaters and sporting events should require. 30% of you, almost a third, think there should be a nationwide mandate on vaccines. And I'm beginning to hear and read that in more and more quarters. So this debate is going to intensify going forward. But those two middle categories, either a mandate for employers in public spaces or an absolute mandate, represents 94% of our group's responses. And I think that's going to be very instructive going forward as we watch this debate play out on a local, state, and national level. Now, the challenge we're facing is different than last year's. Not only is the Delta variant much faster and much more dangerous, but this new threat is different in another important way. Because the data shows so clearly that these mutant strains of the virus disproportionately affect those who have not been vaccinated and allow them to further mutate, the resentment from those who have taken the shot toward those who have not is much greater. Unlike last year, we now have vaccines available to us. But those who've resisted or rejected vaccination are now putting the rest of us at risk. And we're beginning to see increasingly frequent examples of that hostility playing out all over the country. And I will admit to you that I'm very concerned that it may not be long until that anger and that resentment is now is no longer is not just expressed verbally going forward, but positively physically in terms of violence as well. Now, when the shutdown came last spring, most of our frustration had a convenient partisan target. Those who followed the social distancing rules could criticize Donald Trump for his response to the virus. Those who didn't abide by the masking and other requirements, on the other hand, blame their mayors or their governors or their health department officials. So that was pretty standard back and forth partisan politics. Beyond that, it wasn't easy to find, it wasn't easy at all to find a useful scapegoat for whose fault this all was. Uh, making China into a target was somewhat tempting, but Trump's attacks on China turned that into a partisan issue. So anyone who criticized China for the way they dealt with the virus was all of a sudden going to be typecast as a Trump supporter, which of course meant that half the country wouldn't be willing to make that argument in public anymore. Um, let's agree that blaming either nature or biology wasn't very satisfying either. So what we were left with was this immense crisis, but no handy villain on whom we could assign responsibility. Now we have one. 
lots of them. And those are the people who haven't gotten the virus. Now, making matters worse is that most of us thought that the worst of the pandemic was behind us just a few weeks ago. Most of the country was making plans for a post-COVID existence. Uh, businesses were getting their schedules ready to bring their employees back into the workplace. The schools were working through the logistics of in-person classes. And local and state governments around the country were putting aside their masking requirements. But now we're backsliding. And most of the determination and the commitment and the patience that got us through last year is largely dissipated. We're realizing that COVID is going to be with us for some time. And the people who we know are responsible for its resurgence are very apparent, the people who won't get vaccines. And so the temptation to lash out against those resistors is just going to grow and grow and grow. So question number two, if we can, Claire, let's see what the group thinks about this. How do you personally feel about people who have not been vaccinated? Personally, we talked before about how society ought to respond to those who have not gotten a vaccine. But this is more about personal feelings. Number one, I'm angry and resentful. They're putting us all at risk. Number two, I'm disappointed but respectful because we need to do more to persuade them to go ahead and get the vaccines. Third, I pay no attention to them. They're not worth my time. Or fourth, I respect them for standing on principle. And let's see our uh, let's see our results on this one, Claire. Huh? Wow! Look at that. Very interesting. Seventy-two percent. Not surprising. Almost three quarters of our group says that they're it says that we're angry and resentful. Twenty-two percent, a little bit less than a quarter, are disappointed but respectful, and the last are are more dismissive in in one way or another. Very interesting. So here's the challenge for this, for the vast majorities of people who are angry and frustrated, and our poll numbers here today reflect what we see around the country in terms of the anger and resentment that is growing. Here's the challenge. The challenge for us is that screaming and yelling and threatening people is very rarely the best way of convincing someone to do something that they didn't want to do. So those of us who have been vaccinated and are understandably frustrated by the holdouts, we're going to need to find a more productive strategy for winning converts. If we give in to our angry instincts, the societal divide we've been experiencing is going to grow even wider. And more immediately, the threat of COVID is going to grow even worse. It's not going to be easy, but we've got to find a way to do better. Simply put, if we give in to our rage, the virus wins. So while living in a hyperpolarized society like this one normally means that our first instinct is to attack the people with whom we disagree, the repercussions of that approach in this regard could be a lot more dire than some angry cable TV or internet raging, like maybe another even worse COVID surge. We've all been indulging these, pol these polarizing partisan instincts for some time now. And many of us, too many of us, tend to feed and fuel the mutual resentment. Let's see if we're capable of holding it back and finding another way when it's so important to bring a society together, not necessarily politically, but medically, physically, and in every way possible. We'll certainly be talking about this topic quite a bit going forward, but for right now, let's move on from the broader COVID discussion, particularly about vaccines, to talking about what the resurgence of the virus means to the economy. Because for months now, we've been hearing about the post-COVID recovery, but if COVID isn't going away, then what happens to the economy? What do you think? Claire, can we uh, put up our next question for the group? So how do you feel about where the U.S. economy is headed? Do you see major economic growth ahead? Do you see some growth, but smaller and more gradual, perhaps because of the resurgence? Or do you see the recovery being short-circuited? Do you think it'll be a shallow or a short recession instead? 
or are you very worried that we may be heading into longer term economic troubles? Um, hard to predict, but interested in just in people's mindsets and their moods on this one. And if you look at those answers, this group is very emphatic. Almost two thirds, 64%, believe the economy will grow, but a smaller and a more gradual recovery. Add that to the 13% who see major economic growth ahead, and that's more than three quarters, that's 77% who are generally optimistic about the state of the economy, 24% more pessimistic, and we'll see going forward in the weeks and months and I suppose years ahead, whose predictions turn out to be right, but as an indicator of mood, three quarters of you, a little bit more, tend to be leaning toward the positive, one quarter, a little bit less, perhaps a little bit less convinced. Now, as the vaccination campaign progressed throughout the spring and early summer, as you all know, the White House was predicting that the U.S. economy would come roaring back to life because they believed, as did most leading economists, that as COVID passed, consumers would very quickly return to pre-pandemic spending levels. And President Biden has said repeatedly throughout the spring and early summer that he believes the economy is set to grow at its fastest pace in almost four decades. But even though they're not saying it out loud, Biden and his team are getting very concerned about the economy. They know that the surge in virus cases is threatening their economic strategy. We're seeing, well, they're seeing, we're all seeing major ups and downs in the stock market, warning signs in the housing sector, cautionary signals from the Federal Reserve, and many leading forecasters are beginning to think what had been very upbeat predictions, just as many of you are rethinking and still optimistic, but somewhat more subdued. Now, Biden's team is especially worried that, about the possibility of a new round of lockdowns and the effect that that could have on the economy. But even without anything as dramatic as another round of stay-at-home orders, even indoor mask mandates at stores, at shops, at malls, at restaurants could have the ability, uh, a big ability, to impact shopping behavior and consumer attitudes. So a renewed pandemic could discourage consumer spending if fears reemerge about the safety of returning to some of those activities. There's also international ramifications here. The international economy, because this is something that's obviously going on worldwide, the international economy is very vulnerable in this regard also. The Delta variant spread to other countries has already hurt U.S. supply chains and shortages in products from other countries uh, may cause inflation to grow by increasing the cost, the, by increasing the price of production and shipping. Now, the problems overseas mean that orders are delayed for months on furniture, on appliances, on microchips, and on other home building and manufacturing supplies. And because of all this, U.S. home builder confidence fell to a one-year low last month because builders weren't able to get the materials they need. Um, and the delays are causing headaches, but they're also causing some builders to halt construction altogether. And of course, that puts business and jobs at risk. Now, in all likelihood, we're not going to see any relief on the supply chain until early next year, even if the virus doesn't considerably worsen. And if you add that other inflationary pressures caused by increase in increases in government spending and a shortage of qualified workers looking for jobs, we may be seeing evidence of the first sustained inflation in this country in decades. And the concern about inflation among voters and politicians has grown pretty quickly. So what do you think? What, uh, what, uh, what do all of you think about inflation? How concerned should we be about that, about the threat right now? Should we be very concerned? Should we, would we, should we be mildly concerned? Or should we not be concerned at all? Because the debate going on is whether the price increases we're seeing now are temporary or long-term. Uh, but it's very clear that the White House 
is sensitive to the criticism they're hearing about inflation. So the president and his team are spending more time and effort to reassure voters not to worry about a situation that they argue is a temporary one created by post-COVID growth, and it's not going to be an ongoing concern. Let's see if that message is working with our group, Claire. Very interesting. Um, only 4% of our group is not concerned about inflation. Otherwise, we see a split. 39%, somewhat more than a third, are very concerned about inflation, presumably that it might be long-term beyond a post-COVID boom. And 57% mildly concerned. So it's the kind of thing we'll keep our eye on uh, going forward. Now, more broadly, uh, we may be able to learn from Europe's, exper Europe's experience in dealing with the virus surge. As many of you probably know, several countries, including France and Italy and Great Britain, are, 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 impo are imposing even stronger masking and vaccination requirements than the US. So we're going to watch their experiences over the next few weeks. But given the cultural differences that we saw last year during the first rounds of shutdown, it, it's going to be much, much harder for the Biden administration and governors and mayors around the country to impose shutdown measures again if the virus does get worse here. And as we know, if they, if they do, that's going to discourage consumer activity and therefore job creation and economic growth too. Now, all of this is happening just as many of the post-COVID benefits that have kept the economy afloat are beginning to expire. Federal unemployment benefits go back to pre-COVID levels at the end of next month. As many of you have read, it's been a huge story this week. The anti-eviction mandates are ending. And many of the unspent COVID funds that Congress appropriated last year now look like they're going to be redirected for infrastructure spending in the new legislation. On the other hand, before you get too gloomy, the infrastructure bills making their way through Congress have the potential to lead to notable economic growth, especially if you look at the bills that came out over the weekend, the transportation sector, the energy sector, uh, technology and construction all stand to benefit immensely from the infrastructure investment if the bill does pass into law. And obviously we'll talk about that in much more detail when the bill does pass. But for right now with our remaining minutes, uh, let's move on to our third topic. And let's talk about the Congressional Committee investigation into the January 6th riots. Uh, because as all of you know, we talked about it briefly last week because a couple of you asked about it. It's one of the reasons we made it a topic for today. Last week was the opening day of the House Select Committee investigation into the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And it's hard to predict how many minds were changed about the events of that day. But if you watch the testimony from those four police officers who fought the rioters, you know how heart-wrenching that hearing was. But we're going to talk in just a minute about the political impact of their testimony. Before we do, though, let's go back to Claire one more time, and we'll ask her to put up our last question. And I'm going to ask all of you to tell us what you think should be the outcome of the January 6th congressional investigation. Do you think that those who encourage the riots should face public condemnation? Or alternatively, do you think that those who encourage the riots should face criminal penalties, including prison time? On the other hand, do you think that only those who actually committed the violence that day should be held responsible? Or finally, do you think, given the tremendous divides in society, that the best thing to do is simply to move on because arguing this out is only going to divide the country further? I think I know our group pretty well by now, by now Claire. So I think I could make an educated guess on what we're going to see. But thank you for saving me from, from that. Um, yeah, this is pretty much what I would have expected from our group. 62%, almost two-thirds of our group believes that not just those who committed the violence, but those who encouraged it should face prison time. A smaller number said that they should be, you know, 23% said that those encouraging the, viol the riots should be held 
publicly accountable uh, without criminal uh, penalties for prison time, 13%, a much smaller number, say that only those who are actively involved in the riot should be held responsible in the judicial system. And only 2% say, hey, we really do need to move on from this. So I think the two top categories are the ones who are going to carry the day, not just today, but going forward with the investigations. But I do want to get back to the first day and the extraordinarily emotional and impactful testimony of those four officers. Those four police officers from the Capitol Police and from the DC Metro Police, they reminded everybody why the events leading up to and including January 6th demand a thorough and nonpartisan investigation. In their descriptions, they provided very compelling reasons, in my opinion. The investigation is worth the time and the money and the political divisions they are going to come along with it. They reminded us that their defense of the Capitol that day was a defense of democracy. And I think we all have to remember that when democracy was threatened that day, those officers held the line and they allowed our elected officials to finish their work of finalizing the outcome of a presidential election. Now, completely aside from the admiration that I hope you share with me that we hold for them, that testimony and those actions and that bravery give the officers an immense amount of stature and therefore a lot of influence on how the hearings move forward. And because of the emotional impact of their testimony, their call in particular for a full examination of Donald Trump's role could be a very important marker for Congress as they move forward with their hearings. Now, the officer's testimony, make no mistake about it, basically provided marching orders for the committee. And it also provided them, in my opinion, a considerable amount of political cover as well, because the committee now has the officer's support and their credibility to investigate what happened, how and why it happened, and not incidentally, the role played by Trump and those close to him. Now, we've talked before about other aspects of the investigation, other aspects of civil unrest and violence that need to be investigated. And I agree that it is important to examine questions about security in the Capitol, about the interaction of various law enforcement agencies that day, about how the Pentagon responded to the insurrection, any questions about intelligence breakdowns. And as I've said before, there is a case to be made for separate hearings on other examples of government property and law enforcement that we've seen around the country over the last year or so. But it's very clear as a result of last Tuesday that the greatest value and the most intense focus of this investigation is going to be on the role that Trump and his allies played. Now, Liz Cheney, the Republican representative who has become an outcast of her party for agreeing to participate in this committee, she said on Tuesday, she said her goal was, quote, to examine every minute of that day in the White House, every phone call, every conversation, every meeting leading up to, during, and after the attack, unquote. Now, that is a very specific focus. And it is not surprising, for reasons we've talked about in previous weeks, that Republicans have resisted this investigation from the start given what is now becoming clear will be the primary focus of the committee. But I wonder if by resisting the investigation, I wonder if the Republicans might have outsmarted themselves on this one. Because taking this line of attack has kept their base in line and it's kept Trump relatively peaceful and we've discussed the political ramifications of that for them. But by pushing back the way they have, Republicans now have no voice in the committee's work. And that lack of presence in the ongoing deliberations could very well marginalize them and largely drown out their counter message. Now, last week, many of you in the surveys felt that I was uh, 
taking partisan sides on the Republican side. Some of you in today's survey will write in saying, based on what I've just said, that I'm taking the Democrat side. But I will remind you as we wrap up this session that I try my best, at least in these sessions with all of you, not to take anyone's side, not to talk in my opinion about who's right or wrong, because there's plenty of other places that you can go for that. And I have enough respect for all of you as smart people, as part of our audience, that you don't need me to tell you each week who's right and who's wrong, but rather to offer an overall assessment of the landscape and what it may mean. And what this may mean, based on what I was telling you, is that while there are many, many issues on which the Democrats can mess up on, which we now in next November, and the polls show that they're losing in key swing districts around the country and their majorities imperiled. But given what we've just talked about, if the investigation into January 6th does become a major issue in the midterms, that could be a big problem for Republican pan candidates and perhaps create an equalizing measure as the fight for Congress uh, continues uh, through next year. With that, uh, we're just about at the bottom of the hour, maybe a minute over. So Jessica, if you're willing to, to join me and let's hear what our group has to say. Sure, spicy conversation this morning. So we've got some spicy questions coming through. Um, the first question, Israel is now giving booster shots. What does that look like for the United States? Well. The discussion about booster shots is taking place not just in Israel, but around the world. And as some of you may have seen, uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies, I believe it was Pfizer, suggested a few weeks ago that they thought uh, a booster might be necessary. The Biden administration has not yet said that that will be the case. But if you remember, even going back to early this year when the vaccines were first beginning to be distributed, there was a very widespread speculation that like flu vaccines, like smallpox vaccines, that none of these shots last forever. And while we still don't know what the duration is of the protection they provide, I think it is a virtual certainty that we will need to get boosters on a regular basis as we go forward. The unresolved question is, is not whether, but when. So this is something that's coming and we'll learn more, I suspect, I'd say probably over the next 60 days, as the CDC and other medical ex experts come to more considered conclusions as to the timing of the boosters. But the question is, as I said a moment ago, not whether they'll be required, whether they'll be necessary or not, but simply, but rather when. Why can't the FDA approve the vaccines now, given so much evidence of their success in keeping folks out of hospitals or deaths? But, you know, it is worth remembering that the FDA granted emergency use permission for the vaccines at absolutely record speed. And there are, to be fair to the questioner, a growing number of voices, respected voices in the medical community, who are saying that there shouldn't, it shouldn't be taking this long to get final approval. But they are being careful. And I think in some regard, uh, the the, the government authorities are a victim of their own success with the vaccine. That because the original approval came so quickly, we all got understandably impatient. And I think all of us are ready for final approval, not only for our own peace of mind, but you have a sizable plurality of those who have not been vaccinated that say they'll be more willing to once final approval is given. And it'll be much easier from a legal perspective for places of business to enforce vaccine mandates once final approval is given. So President Biden mentioned a couple weeks ago that he thought that this is something that would be done within the next month or two. But I do think it is important for us to remember, as eager as we are, is that the speed of the development and emergency approval of the vaccines to begin with came at such an unprecedented rate. Uh, that we shouldn't, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't become too reliant on that speed continuing. And at some level, I think you'd agree that the appropriate authorities proceeding with care, even if not quite as quickly, is probably the better route to take. It seems important that the states and CDC report the data accurately regarding COVID-19 positive cases so we can have an honest and clear understanding of what is actually happening in the US 
It is my understanding that as of May 1st, the CDC is no longer collecting data or reporting the number of fully vaccinated COVID-19 patients who are not hospitalized or have died. However, they continue to report the number of positive cases of unvaccinated or non-fully vaccinated people who are COVID-19 pos positive, hospitalized, or have died. This seems to be a misrepresentation of the data. Perhaps fully vaccinated people are also responsible for spreading COVID-19 because more are positive than realized, even if they are not as sick, hospitalized, or dead. How do we hold our scientific community, government, and states accountable for accurate reporting of this information? So the questioner's understanding uh, is exactly right. Uh, the CDC has struggled with data management on any number of fronts over the course of the pandemic. And their work has been far from flawless. And whether you forgive them for that, given the once in a century nature of the challenge, is entirely up to you. But the practical impact, regardless of whether you blame lay blame um, or, or recognize the challenges involved or some combination, the practical impact is it's created immense confusion among the American public. And the Biden administration has been working furiously uh, to try to convince the nation's news media to, in their, from their standpoint, to calm down their reporting. They feel like the reporting on the Delta variant has been unnecessarily inflammatory, and they've been trying to convince the networks and other major news organizations to make it more clear how rare it is for someone who's already been vaccinated to contract the virus. And that's one of the reasons that earlier in today's program, I mentioned that it's been reported that President Biden is considering an address to the nation. And it's the reason I thought that that address would be such a good idea. I understand there's a lot of moving parts. And I understand, in fairness to the CDC, that the Delta variant is a much different challenge than the one we've faced in the past. And it's a much different type of challenge than what we thought we were seeing even just a few weeks ago. But when people are frightened and confused, that's not the best recipe for society moving forward together to confront the challenge. And so I do think for the president to address the country and to clarify a lot of this confusion I think is a very important role for him to play. Uh, I would say, in fact, that it's one of the reasons that Joe Biden was elected, one of the main reasons that Joe Biden was elected last November, because many Americans felt that he was the type of leader they could turn to in times of crisis. And so I hope the reports are accurate and I do hope the president addresses the country in order to give us better guidance. The CDC's data management is never going to be perfect, just given the rapidly nature changer, changing nature of what we're facing. But I do think that even in the uh, absence of complete data, a clearer message is gonna be to everyone's benefit. What are your thoughts on the symbolic significance of Obama holding a very large Martha's Vineyard 60th birthday party? 700 people given the virus situation? Well, most of you have probably read about this, that the former president and his wife are looking to hold a very sizable uh, birthday celebration. And even while abiding by COVID uh, restrictions, it's caused a great deal of consternation, not just because of the example of bringing hundreds of people together uh, for a private party, but the risk that it presents to the people who are going to be working at the event and in the surrounding community. I'd actually thought about making that one of the three topics today, Jessica, and I thought it'd be a little bit unfair to the former president. I don't like to make predictions, as all of you know, as we've, we've uh, stated very emphatically over the course of our time together, but I will say this, I will be astounded if Barack Obama ends up celebrating his 60th part birthday as it was originally planned. Each of you individually can decide whether it would have been the right thing to do or not, given the precautions that he was uh, and his family were talking about taking. But the potential for public backlash against uh, an event like that is so pronounced that I can't help but to believe that uh, the Obamas will realize that it's not a good example to set and they will rethink it. And with any luck, he'll be able to celebrate his 61st the way he would have liked to celebrate his 60th. Hey, 
I've celebrated a birthday recently too, and I will simply tell you I did not celebrate it the way I would have liked to because of COVID either, but I will. And I figure if the rest of us can, I, I suspect the former president will come to the same conclusion. I was gonna say on the topic of birthdays, I noticed and several of our audience members noticed your happy birthday card over your shoulder on the shelf behind you. So happy birthday from all of us and uh, from the audience members. Uh, if you wanna play a Where's Waldo, you can look uh, over Dan's right shoulder. You can see his happy every, birthday card. Every, every single one of us uh, has celebrated a birthday, many of us two birthdays under COVID. You know what? We make two. And I suspect yeah. Barack Obama will as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, would you support a monetary penalty for non-vaccinated, for example, full cost recovery for hospital care for COVID? And then somebody is also asking about insurance companies refusing to cover uh, any COVID related hospital or medical uh, procedures for those that are not vaccinated. Well, this is why the earlier questioners uh, point about the pace of FDA approval was so important because many mandates, whether they include financial penalties or other types of, uh, uh, yeah, or other types of measures, are on much firmer legal ground once the vaccine does have formal FDA approval. And there's a lot of concern among business owners, uh, among you know, restaurant owners, among the owners of stores and shops and so on, is that imposing those kind of requirements now before the formal FDA approval Leaves them on uh, leaves them on much more precarious legal ground. So I don't know if I'm at a point yet where I'd uh, impose a financial penalty on someone who isn't vaccinated. Like many of you, I get awfully impatient and awfully frustrated. But I think the question for us to consider, and I don't have an and I don't have an answer for those of you who read or hear of a good solution to this, we'll be eager to hear it too, and perhaps we can talk about it next week. But as I said in the earlier part of the program today screaming and yelling and threatening people is not a good way to get them to do something that they, that they resist doing. And in a political context, it can, be, it can be fairly cathartic. The stakes are a lot higher here. So what we have to figure out as a society is a more effective way of getting those who haven't been vaccinated to get vaccinated. Is that suggesting that I'm against a vaccine mandate? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that if we move in that direction, we have to find a way to do it in a way that's going to be effective, not just emotionally satisfying. Yeah, I, I bet a lot of people are waiting for that FDA approval before they get the vaccine. I don't know if that's um, if there's any polls on that or not. It's it's a great question, Jessica, and there there is some polling on that, and perhaps this is something we can talk about in more detail in a future program. But those who haven't been vaccinated, as we've discussed before, fall into two basic categories. Those who won't under any circumstances, and those who have concerns or obstacles to it, but just haven't done it yet. And not a majority of that second category, but a large, but a but a, a relevant plurality have specifically mentioned formal FDA approval as something that would make them feel better about going ahead. So I'm I'm glad you raised it. Um, this questioner says, what's the alternative to our anger and resentment? What can I do to educate people to be vaccinated? Well, every single one of us, whether it's with coworkers, whether it's with family members, with neighbors, every single one of us probably on a fairly regular basis has to face a situation in which we have to persuade someone to do something or try to persuade someone to do something that they'd prefer not to do. And every single one of us has developed different means of persuasion. Just what I've learned uh, over my time in politics is that beginning the discussion by telling the other person how stupid they are is very rarely going to bring them around. And I do believe that ultimately the answer here is going to be some combination of carrot and sticks. But as many of us get angry and angry and more and more frustrated, and more and more resentful, it becomes more and more tempting to turn to the stick completely, not to the carrot. But if we do draw, if each of us draws from our own life experience about how we engage in constructive conversation to persuade people who we deal with or work with or live with to change their mind about things that are important to us, I'd say for each one of us, that's most likely to be the most effective model for persuading people we know who we get along with in other circumstances 
under other circumstances to agree with us on this one too. So I wish I had a better answer than that. All I know is that the screaming and the yelling and the threatening is probably not going to result in a lot of change behavior. So we do have to come up with something better. Yeah, and Americans. if they results this week, um, we'd be excited to hear your own thoughts. And Jessica, perhaps this is something we can talk about in a future program too. Yeah, I was going to say Americans have a history of being resistant to health care advice or health advice. So it's, it's an uphill battle <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, um, uh, there's a difference though between an uphill battle and an unwinnable battle, right? Uh, what has been done around the world that has worked to slow or stop the virus that the U.S. Biden administration has not done yet? Would those measures work here or not? Okay, Jessica, I lost you for just a moment at the beginning of the question, so if you wouldn't mind repeating okay. it, that would be great. Sure. What has been done around the world that has worked to slow or stop the virus that the U.S. Biden administration has not done yet? Would those measures work here or not? This is one of the reasons I think that watching Great Britain and Italy and France is so important, because they have imposed uh, more stringent vaccine requirements, not society-wide or countrywide mandates, but rather uh, more stringent requirements for entering restaurants, sporting events, theaters, that sort of thing, and other types of public gathering. And so watching to see the effect of those approaches I think is going to be very, very helpful to us. But it is worth noting that for many of the countries that avoided the worst of the virus last year, particularly Pacific Rim countries, are now struggling through this as well. So I don't know of uh, a nation that has come up with a magic formula that we could copy, but watching other countries as they experiment with different types of requirements, I think is our uh, uh, is our best bet at this point, that and getting more people vaccinated. How will robotics and automation figure into the number of jobs that will come back or be created? Well, it's a fascinating question and one, again, Jessica, that probably deserves uh, a full topic for us at some point in the future. But everything that I've read suggests that the pace of automation of jobs, particularly service industry jobs, accelerated dramatically as a result of the pandemic. In other words, very little technology was invented over the last year to allow the, many of those, these jobs to switch from humans to, to machines or to robots. But there's always a considerable lag time between the invention of a technology and a comfort level arriving so uh, to a point where it's available for common use. And what the pandemic did is it made that transition period go much, much faster. So my, my guess going forward is that, again, the, the service industry in particular uh, is going to look a lot different post-COVID than it did pre-COVID. I think one of the things being talked about in the context of the Biden infrastructure plans is massive worker retraining programs. And historically, when we've talked about worker retraining in this country, at least in modern history, we've talked about retraining those whose specialty has been in manufacturing or construction as those jobs become more automated. But one of the most interesting things that the Biden Department is, uh, the, the administration is talking about, particularly in the Department of Commerce under Secretary Raimondo, is those types of job training programs for service employees too because many of the jobs they left at the beginning of the COVID are now being done through automation, and that's not gonna change back. Do you think the US dollar will remain the dominant currency and retain its reserve currency status? I, I'm not smart enough to make a prediction here, but, while I would, but what I would say is this, that while China has been moving very aggressively like it is on so many other fronts, to try to establish primacy in this area. They very badly want the yen uh, to be uh, the currency of choice for the world rather than, rather than the dollar. Um, I wonder if the suspicions that have, in, uh, that have developed toward China, not only among the US and our allies, but more broadly around the world, might create some hesitance to moving from one form of currency to the other. The US is far from beloved around the world, 
but I do believe that the levels of suspicion about China putting aside uh, coronavirus related questions, but concerns about the very doctrinaire way they've imposed lending requirements on countries with whom they've worked and provided financial assistance for their own infrastructure and building projects. I think you'll see a pretty considerable hesitation um, on the world stage to moving from the dollar to the yen, not because of what the US is doing right, but because of the suspicions that continue to rise about China's behavior. Why were the funds allocated to landlords and tenants not distributed? Well, this is the most overlooked and I think most appalling aspect of the debate um, over eviction relief. There is an yeah, there is an argument, and six Supreme Court justices, um, including uh, the three remaining Democratic appointees, all argued that while you know, they're, they're greatly concerned about the plight of those who might be evicted, they recognize that given the way our Constitution sets up the separation of powers, that the administration can only act unilaterally in this regard for a certain period of time before Congress has to act. There's another conversation for us to have at some point about why the Biden administration waited until just a day or two before the deadline to push Congress more forcefully to act. But regardless, the questioner raises a very important point. More than 90% of the money that has been allocated for renter relief has not made its way to renters yet. And we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. And that has been one of the reasons for the opposition that the opponents to extending tenant relief or tenant eviction protection uh, protections uh, it's been their primary argument against uh, against an extension but why hasn't that money been spent because government moves really really slowly and we've seen here in california the incredible problems we've had with our state's employment development department every single one of you in every other state in the country, is I am I'm almost certain, has read stories about struggles that local and state and federal government has had in navigating such a rapidly changing set of circumstances throughout COVID. There's been confusion over the requirements for uh, distributing the money. There's been arguments uh, about how uh, stringently to require applicants to fill out the paperwork appropriately. On one hand, you want to protect against, protect against fraud, which has been a huge problem in other areas. On the other hand, those who are in most peril of eviction tend to be individuals with less education, often from other countries who speak other languages. And every local and state government around the country is wrestling with how quickly to move that money out the door to those individuals and families, even if the paperwork hasn't been done the right way or not. Because on one hand, you want to be supportive and compassionate to those in need. On the other hand, you don't want to make it too easy for those who would take the money for less commendable reasons. But the very short argument is it's a really big, complicated government that moves slowly, even under the best of circumstances. And so there's a lot of blame to go around at the local and state level not adapting. But I also don't think that either under the Trump or the Biden administrations, there has until last Thursday been nearly enough of a push or nearly much of an effort to get those local and state governments to move more quickly. So lots of blame to go around. Uh, Biden is clearly feeling the political heat on this one. I'd be surprised if this isn't one of our issues either next week or the week after. Uh, but at least for now, Let's, uh, the, I think the one thing that's clear is that everyone is scrambling to do something in a way that they should have been doing weeks, if not months ago. How concerned are you about inflation caused by climate change? Water shortages in the Southwest could have a significant impact on agriculture and food prices. Well, I'm, I'm concerned about inflation for any number of reasons. And climate change is one of them, but I don't know that you can separate out the causes. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's reason to be concerned about inflation uh, because of a post-COVID buying spree. There's a lot of pent-up consumer uh, activity that hasn't 
had the ability to express itself for over a year now. And if we are heading into even a small, shallow recovery, like most of our group thinks, that's going to uh, lead to uh, a boom, which is going to lead to increased prices. The very peculiar labor markets we're seeing now, where so many uh, companies, particularly in the service industry, are having trouble filling jobs, has the potential to lead to inflation too. The questioner is absolutely right. Long before COVID, you saw about the potential impact that climate could have on inflation, not just as it relates to water, but if water is more expensive, that means agriculture is more expensive, that means crops are more expensive, that means groceries are more expensive. So I am concerned about inflation. I don't know yet, going back to the earlier question, whether what we're seeing now is a short-term, almost post-COVID phenomena, or a longer-term challenge such as what we saw in the 1970s and in early 80s. Uh, but it's a concern to me for many reasons, in including uh, that which the questioner raised. When several Republican lawma lawmakers were asked their opinion of the January 6th panel of four police officers uh, that was televised, most said they didn't watch it. Kevin McCarthy is conducting his own investigation. How can we learn to prevent the next one with these attitudes? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the next one refers to, but what I would say, as we've talked about on this program before, is that most Republicans, not all, but most, recognize the potential impact that Donald Trump can have on their political livelihoods. And most of them, you've got a, a few who are pushing back at him visibly and forcefully, the way Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and some others are. And you've got a few who are standing with them out of conviction. We've talked about those individuals in the past. But I think the vast majority of Republican elected officials are somewhere in the middle. Just they know what happened on January 6th was wrong. But they also know that if they stand up and talk about it the way that Cheney and Kitzinger and some others are, that it could greatly imperil their political fortunes. And before we dismiss them completely as career politicians and political opportunists, remember that most elected officials in both parties want to remain in office, not just so they can be in office, but because they think they can accomplish laudable policy goals. I don't know how the Republican Party navigates itself forward on this one. There is a special election in the state of Ohio today for a vacant congressional seat between a Trump-supported candidate and opponents. Last week in a similar special election in Texas, the non-Trump candidate beat the Trump-supported candidate. Does that mean that Donald Trump's hold on the Republican Party is gone? But no, it, it does not mean that. But what it does mean is as we've been talking about since January, as time passes, his hold on the party will become somewhat less strong. Public opinion polling shows that his support among Republicans, while still very, very high, is about 10 points lower than where it was in January. And as time passes, more and more Republicans are going to have to ask themselves, do I continue to stand with him and risk the potential political fallout? Or do I work in a bipartisan manner, not just on, based, on, on investigations like these, but on other matters? It's worth noting that most Repu that there's a, it appears that there's a sizable number of Republicans in the Senate and the, in the House as well who are going to ignore Trump's warnings to vote against the infrastructure bill. Trump put out a statement on that last week, and it didn't really seem to impact the Republican members of the game of, of the Gang of 20. So again, as we've talked about before, I think the Republican Party, as time passes, will become less in uh, in uh, uh, under Trump's control, but that change is going to happen very slowly and, and very gradually. And as it happens, we'll see more and more independent action. But January 6th, at least for now, is clearly a bridge too far for most of them. Uh, final question. Will we also see a commission call for public condemnation or prison time for those politicians and others that supported the, quote, peaceful protests that devolved into over 100 days of riots last year across the country and resulted in destruction of hundreds of small businesses and the deaths of many more people than passed away on January 6th. Well, I can't speak to the penalties that would be imposed, but as I've said on this program before, I do believe that just as Congress is and should be investigating the uh, events of January 6th, 
it should also be investigating the types of violence that took place around the country last year in Portland and Seattle and Chicago and in so many other cities. I think those should be two separate investigations because I do believe an attack on the US Capitol is different than what we saw in other places. But those other attacks on government property, on law enforcement, on private property were serious. And so I, 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 I agree with I think much of the questioner's premise that while I don't think it does any good for either investigation to merge them together into one committee, I do think both on separate but parallel tracks are topics that do need a lot more time and attention. And I do hope that even while the January 6th investigation does proceed, as it should, that Congress at some point is willing to exhibit the same level of interest in the other types of violence that the questioner asked about. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much. And uh, again, happy belated birthday from all of us. So uh, again, you got more and more uh, happy birthday wishes in the chatter and the questions. So thanks again for your time as always. Thank you, Jessica, both for the birthday wishes and for all the great work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, thank you as always. You do such a great job managing all of those dozens and dozens of questions. Dan, uh, as always, thank you for your guidance and your expertise. And I, I wanted to remind everyone that our members every other week have the wonderful opportunity of speaking with you directly virtually in a format uh, that is more of a go-to meeting where they can interact directly with you um, after each program, and we're going to be doing that in just a few minutes. So if any of you would like to become members and get an opportunity to connect more directly with Dan, please sign up and become a member today. We have just a couple of um, updates on upcoming programs that you can register for on our website. This week, we have a special member screening, the Lost Leonardo. Of course, every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, politics in the time of coronavirus. We have another member screening August 13th through the 15th with Congresswoman Barbara Lee speaking truth to power. And on August 16th, quarantine fatigue, travel in a post-pandemic world. So please go to our website, sign up for our programs. You can view all of our past live streams, all of Dan's past programs as well on the live stream, become a member, make a donation. Everybody stay safe and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.